thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you coming out. I'm Diane Davis. I'm the director of the Digital Writing and Research Lab. Every year, we host at least one speaker. And um, to give you some sense of the incredible awesomeness of this annual speaker series, let me do just a little bit of name, name dropping, if you'll indulge me. Um, just a few of the speakers we've hosted in the past eight or so years. Greg Ulmer, Victor Vitanza, Cynthia Haynes, Cynthia Self, Michael Joyce, Jenny Rice, Paul Miller, AKA DJ Spooky, Barbara Biesecker, Alex Reed, Josh Gunn. He's here, where are you? Right there. Hey. <laughs> Rita Rayleigh and Jody Shipka. We're all incredibly lucky, right, to have had the ability to bring these people in, to have them hang out with us, speak with us, and I personally feel very grateful to have, has, have had such an amazing team to work with that, and they pull these visits together with just minimal glitching, right? Um, so I wanna start by thanking a few people. Will Burdett, I was gonna ask you to stand, you're already standing. Um, he's the, the lab's program coordinator, without whom none of this would be possible. Fred Stanton, who is where? There he is, stand up, please stand up. He's our systems administrator. He takes care of all the tech preparation for these events. Keep standing. <laughs> Get it. Eric Detweiler, who's standing in the back. Kendall Gerdes, where are you? Stand up. And Stephen Lemieux, please stand. Thank you. These are our, associate, our assistant directors, and they do so much work, and so much of it is invisible that I want to take this moment, too, to just thank them. I just think we need to give everyone. This year's speaker, whose name I'll be likely adding to that list to prove how great we are next year. He's an associate professor at Syracuse University and my dear friend, Colin Brooke. Colin and I went to the same graduate program, so he, he came in a few years behind me, and we shared the same dissertation director, Victor Vitanza. I graduated in 1995 and took a position at Old Dominion University. And when I accepted another position, position at the University of Iowa two years later, Colin was just about to graduate, just about to graduate. So I recommended him as my temporary sort of emergency replacement. He accepted the position and then accepted their offer to continue on as an assistant professor that next year, because he was incredibly awesome and they wanted him to stay. He stayed at Old Dominion until 2001 when he joined Syracuse University writing program and stopped following me around. He's now an associate professor in the writing program and the composition and cultural rhetoric doctoral program at Syracuse. He works at the intersections of technology and rhetoric, and his service to the profession includes, for example, serving previously with Derek Mueller as the College Composition and Communications Archive Editor, and serving currently as the inaugural director of electronic resources for the Rhetoric Society of America. Colin's first book, Lingua Fracta, Towards a Rhetoric of New Media, came out with Hampton Press in 2009 and won the Computers and Composition Outstanding Book Award in 2010. He's published articles in Enculturation, Pretext, College Composition and Communication, J and JAC, as well as several very significant essays in various collections and volumes. Eric Detweiler interviewed Colin for the lab's podcast program, Zugma at the RSA conference uh, this past summer in San Antonio, and I encourage you to check that out on our website when you can. We're more than honored to have Colin here today, and please join me in welcoming. Thanks, Diane. I love the optimism of describing Lingua Fracta as my first book. <laughs> um, and I want to thank Diane, and Casey, Will, Eric, and everybody who's um, made my visit absolutely delightful. I'm very happy to be down here. Um, if there's one thing that I've learned uh, just in the last day about the difference between Syracuse and Austin, it's that um, we have slightly different standards for what constitutes a snow day. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> snow for, for one thing yeah so all right um, I hate it when people start their talks with apologies so I'm gonna start my talk with an apology which is that um, I'm very early in this work and so my 
slides are a lot more texty than they normally would be. Um, and I'm, like, I think I'm synthesizing a lot of material. So um, one thing that I'll encourage you to do during Q&A is to actually like ask me to elaborate on some of this stuff. I feel like I'm moving pretty quickly through it. Um, I am also have more of my talk actually scripted than I normally do. I usually try to talk a little bit more off the cuff. But because I'm working through this stuff for the first time, I want to make sure that I'm actually like hitting everywhere I need to hit. So, and it also means I need to remind myself to drink water. All right. Um, uh, Ten years ago this semester, um, I taught a graduate course on network rhetorics, back when the idea of network studies was just beginning to take hold. Books like Barabasi's Linked, Watts' Six Degrees, Buchanan's Nexus, um, and others had begun appearing in 2002 and 2003. Uh, Lev Manovich's Language of New Media was published in 2001. And while his dismissal of rhetoric in that book was premature and later repudiated by Manovich himself, I think that many of us had a sense that, what, that we were turning some kind of corner. And if you think about the history of social media, that corner is existing there too. Um, this was right about the time when blogging was at its peak. Um, MySpace, LinkedIn, Delicious all started in 2003. Um, Facebook, Dig, Flickr in 2004. Um, YouTube and Reddit in 2005. Um, Tumblr and Twitter not that long afterwards. So in the 10 years since then, the idea of networks has evolved from the secret principle behind the six degrees of Kevin Bacon to a nearly obligatory reference in our scholarship. Our network society is characterized by network selves, traversing social networks in this, our networked age. Our collective investment in networks has reached the point where it's hard not to agree with Nate Johnson's observation that the early 21st century will be remembered for network fever, the shared hallucination that all networks lead to understanding. So in light of this exposure, and some would say overexposure, that networks have received in the humanities in recent years, of course I'm going to come and talk to you today about networks. Um, I'm still going to talk about networks, but I want to take a slightly different tack. Rather than identifying them or arguing for their importance or pointing out power laws, I want to think more closely today about the implications that networks have for rhetorical theory and vice versa. Um, the title of my talk, Entropics of Discourse, is a riff on the title of an older book that some of you may remember, um, a collection of essays by Hayden White called Tropics of Discourse. I always pronounce it tropics, and I should pronounce it tropics. Tropics of discourse. So I'm going to start with this idea of tropics of discourse today, which is a reference to the four master tropes. And then I'll turn to networks. And I'll talk a little bit about how I see them resonating with this notion of tropics. Finally, I'll try to bring this resonance to bear on some of the conversations that have emerged around the ideas of post-human or post-humanist rhetorics. Um, I should warn you, and I have warned you, that this is very early in my thinking. And so I welcome your feedback today and even your skepticism. If I'm successful, though, my hope is that you'll leave the room today a little bit convinced that we need to start thinking in terms of rhetorical entropy, that it's not just a devastatingly clever pun in my title. A little more than 20 years ago, um, I came across an essay tucked in the back of Kenneth Burke's Grammar of Motives, his appendix on the four master tropes. Um, and this was my first exposure to them. Uh, Burke's interest in the tropes is not historical. In fact, he barely names them before he sort of translates them into the, the terms of his own project. Um, before I talk about how I take them up in terms of networks, I want to provide a little bit of the history that Burke sort of glosses over. Um, the master tropes themselves are metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, and irony. Um, and while I learned this upon reading Burke, it wasn't until about a year ago that I actually asked myself why these tropes are the master tropes how they actually acquired this designation. Um, curiously enough, the idea, the idea of four master tropes is one of the few disciplinary legacies that um, we have from rhetorical supervillain Peter Ramus. In his arguments in Rhetoric Against Quintilian, Ramus makes the argument that while figures involve a change of expression, and there are lots and lots of figures, in fact, there are only four tropes. Um, tropes both al alter the expression of discourse as well as its meaning. And this idea of four master tropes is actually has kind of survived into the present day with a handful of changes, but none of, none of them have actually sort of taken. Um, just as a side note, if you've ever wanted to read 
a book about classical rhetoric that was written in the style of internet trolling? <laughs> Ramus. Um, this is my favorite line. I am passing over a multitude of false and witless things because my task would be endless if I attacked every single one. He writes just before he goes on to attack every single one. It's, it's, a, it's simultaneously awesome and repulsive. Um, so there's actually a kind of a long history of the master tropes, but it's pretty, in, it's pretty undistinguished. Um, one person who sort of changes things up a little bit is John Battista Vico in The New Science, um, writing in the early 18th century. Um, what he does is to suggest that there might be a progressive logic to the tropes, that is that there's a particular order in which they occur. He argues that societies develop according to a cyclical pattern whose stages correspond to the different modalities um, represented by the tropes. So societies start out at kind of an age of metaphor, the age of gods, move through metonymy, synecdoche, and then an irony, um, it's kind of a descent into barbarism and the chaos and the cycle sort of reboots. And that's kind of Vico's notion of history. Um, is that my phone that keeps making that noise? I think it is. <laughs> All you people blowing up my Twitter. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. He's also the first to imagine the, the tropes as discrete stages of development. Um, and it's that sequence, along with the kind of epistemic function of the master tropes, that gets picked up in the 20th century. Um, so, for example, in Foucault's Order of Things, um, the idea that the tropes provide an epistemic structure for, for human thought is at the heart of that book. Rather than describing individual civilizations or societies, um, for Foucault, the tropes supply the deep structure according to which human knowledge across disciplines develops. The scope of Foucault's account differs from Vico's as well. Writing in the 1960s, Foucault charts a single cycle that begins with the Renaissance and which hadn't yet ended by the time Foucault was writing. So he saw himself kind of in the modern era. So if for Vico, each of the societies is developing according to this pattern, Foucault like stretches it out like 600 years of a single sort of cycle that hadn't yet completed. Um, Foucault's largely quiet about what happens at the end of the cycle, although he has a, a relatively famous passage in the order of things on the death of humanism, where he compares the figure of man to a face drawn in the sand that will sort of get wiped away as easily as it, as it emerged at the end of the classical episteme. So he identifies humanism as a function of the modern era, one that might disappear just as readily as it appears. Um, when Burke takes up the master tropes, he does so in a way that I think is both more personal and more optimistic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he translates the tropes into his own sort of terminology. Um, and I tried to sort of give a paraphrase of that there in the paragraph. Um, but he also retains the idea of the tropes as progressive in the in Vico sense as well as the notion that they have this kind of epistemic function. So with Burke, the tropics of discourse become almost a rhetorical worldview. Um, and it's an optimistic one. Uh, for Burke, we get to the point of synecdoche, and then rather than sort of descending into chaos or rebooting, for Burke, um, the dialectic is this kind of asymptotic stage where you are just constantly sort of honing and refining your representations. Um, so it's a cycle that starts and kind of looks like Vico's, but then it actually never ends. Um, we're rotten with perfection, so we're always just trying to make it better. Um, in terms of scope, Hayden White actually lands somewhere in between Foucault and Burke, and he's drawing on both of them, um, as well as on Vico. Uh, White coins the phrase tropics of discourse, and he uses the framework in his book Metahistory as a way of charting the development of a specifically historical consciousness in the 19th century. White also provides perhaps what I think is the most succinct account of the tropics of discourse as a concept. Um, I really like this definition. Um, explaining that they articulate for us the projective or generational aspect of language, the extent to which it not only represents the world of things, but also constitutes the modality of the relationships among things. And that last little piece I'm going to pull forward in a little bit. Um, for the moment, though, I want to highlight just a few of the themes that this kind of quick and dirty history of the tropes pulls up. Um, first, the idea that the tropes represent discrete stages or modalities. Second, that they, those stages or modalities happen in a particular sequence. Um, and then finally, the idea that that sequence functions epistemically at a range of scales. 
from the personal in the case of Burke to the world historical in the case of Foucault. Um, and some of those things I want to challenge a little bit with networks. One, one element of Vico's cyclical model that's kind of missing from Burke and Foucault and White is the idea that when the cycle ends, there's that age of barbarism, that sort of descent into chaos that reboots the cycle. Um, this image of a fully realized civilization threatened by barbarians at the gate is a recurring motif in our culture. We see it all over the place. Um, but it's not something that's really a part of Foucault or Burke uh, or White. Um, but I think that it's, to me, it's one of the places where, uh, well, l let, me, let me show you a couple passages real quick that sort of express that anxiety in a way that I don't think people writing about the master tropes necessarily do. Um, the first quote is from Edward Hahn's essay from about a year and a half ago in Rhetoric Review. Um, and Hahn is writing about Sid Dobrin, Raul Sanchez, and Byron Hawke's work. And he argues that their sort of turn towards post-composition is quite literally a return to barbarism, that the discipline is at this crossroads and going down that particular path of development is going to like take us into chaos. Um, and I think you see parallel sort of constructions in discussions of the digital humanities. This is an essay by Catherine Tumber from last fall in The Baffler um, called Bulldozing the Humanities. And one of the things that I just want to point to that I'll also pull forward is that she's specifically talking about synecdoche here. Um, for her, the essence of humanism, part of it is this humanist disposition to see particular things in relation to wholes. And that's very much an expression of synecdoche. Um, so I, I think that some of these sort of expressions of anxiety over moves towards posthumanism can be read in terms of this sort of progressive sequence of the master tropes. Um, all right. Um, both of these essays express anxiety about the emergence of posthumanism, but while they're ostensibly writing about different disciplines, rhetoric and composition on one hand, digital humanities on the other, part of what each of them responds to is a turn towards the study of networks. Both um, of these essays sort of directly address that turn. Um, and so I want to sort of bracket this discussion of tropes and combine it with um, a discussion about networks. I think it's important when you talk about networks um, to start with the fact that they're not a recent invention, um, despite our tendency to see them as kind of a digital phenomenon. Um, nor are they, I mean, I don't think they're particular to the digital. I've always been really happy with the definition that Duncan Watts advanced in six degrees, I guess like 12 or 13 years ago now. Um, the idea that a network is a collection of objects connected to each other in some fashion. Um, it's a very nonspecific definition. Um, for me, part of the problem with the widespread adoption of networks in the humanities is that many people just use the word network um, to cover a lot of different types of networks. Um, you know, network is actually a, a pretty nonspecific noun. And so one of the things that I want to do today as a way of combining sort of network studies with the thoughts about tropics of discourse is to actually talk about some of the different network types and actually break them down a little bit. Um, so what I want to do is start by asking you to imagine a very basic network. Um, and networks are just nodes and links. So imagine kind of um, a network of, say, 40 or 50 nodes. And the links are distributed randomly among them. That is, each node has a roughly equal chance of being connected to another. Um, if you assemble a network like that, it kind of looks like this. And I, this is kind of faint. I don't know if you can see like the connections and stuff there, but they're there. Um, so here's what that graph, this is what that graph might look like um, if it were a little bit darker. Um, they distribute connections um, uh, um, according to a bell curve where most of the nodes in the network have roughly an average number of connections. There are a few that have more than normal, a few that have less than normal. But it's a fairly, it's a, a relatively fair distribution of connections. Um, so for example, if you imagine this network as uh, like a network of publications and you imagine the links as citations, this would be a situation where everything was being cited roughly equally. You know, a few things might be cited twice, some might be cited three times, some might be, a couple might be ignored, a couple might be super. 
Um, what's interesting about a random network graph is that, it's, that it has what's called scale. Um, in other words, you can extrapolate from any individual node and sort of infer the system. Um, in this way, in addition to being sort of fair, um, random networks are actually an illustration of synecdoche. That is, the individual is kind of a replica of the universe. Um, it reflects it, reflects the whole system. Um, we can move comfortably across scales from part to whole, and that relationship between part and whole is synecdoche. But of course, the random network is an abstract model. Um, it's not growing and shrinking over time. It's not interacting with any sort of context. Um, academic publications don't happen in this like vacuum. Um, it's an ideal visualization, both in the sense of being abstract, idealized, and representing kind of an ideal distribution of resources. Uh, a much more common form of network are ordered networks, um, non-random networks. Uh, and these are actually the kinds of networks that we don't normally think of as networks. Um, they include hierarchies, organizations, institutions, ecologies. We're surrounded by these kinds of networks. Although be because we have other specific names for them, we don't always think of them that way. Uh, and honestly, that's a mistake. Um, I think in some early network studies, what you find is people who, well, for instance, um, Mark C. Taylor's The Moment of Complexity, uh, networks are contrasted with grids. And really, a grid is a kind of a network. It's just a network arranged in a very specific fashion. Um, and I think you see that across a lot of early work in network studies where um, distinctions between two kinds of networks are being treated as a distinction between network and something else entirely. Um, our neighborhoods and our workplaces collect us together geographically, for example. Um, but that doesn't mean that either of them is any less of a network than our friends list on Facebook. I think one of the problems with uh, these, these, this early work is that sort of false opposition that people imagine between these kinds of networks and um, more scale-free networks. Um, these non-random non graphs also possess scale, although it's based on proportion rather than representation or equality. So for example, there's no way to infer an entire football team from by looking at a single player, the quarterback or the outside linebacker, whatever. And yet their relative contributions to the game are consistent from team to team. Uh, the system itself stays consistent. If the football team loses a player, it finds someone who can actually sort of fill that niche. Um, in, this, in this sense, ordered networks tend to function metaphorically or even allegorically. Um, so it's not that each node within a system is equal to every other one, but proportionally they sort of play the same roles. Um, that is, they also have scale. Uh, and as I'm about to discuss, not all networks possess scale, but it's something that we largely take for granted uh, in the networks that surround us. In scaled networks, individual nodes bear a fairly static relationship to the network as a whole, whether that relationship is representative or proportional, but the system itself remains stable. A team may adjust its tactics based on the particular talents of a given player, but it doesn't reinvent the game itself. Um, a big part of the, of the reason for the emergence of network studies has been the articulation of networks that actually don't have scale. Um, Scale-free networks are collections of objects that don't behave according to the same rules of random or design networks. Um, so imagine, imagine that random network one more time, but instead of just staying static, imagine it as um, having new nodes added to it. So for if, if that was a, a map of citations, new things are being published. And as they're being published, instead of having an equal chance of being connected to any other thing within the network, imagine that the nodes that have the most connections automatically have a higher chance of attracting new ones. Um, the idea of growth is just that the network is always adding nodes. And the second thing is the notion of preferential attachment. Um, and these are the two sort of minimal necessary conditions for a scale-free network. Um, let me just talk it through. Uh, the idea of preferential attachment is that as certain nodes get richer, they attract more attention and they end up getting richer at a faster pace. So um, sociologist Robert Merton called this the Matthew effect. And it's based on that vi the Bible verse from Matthew. Um, For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. 
Um, it's the idea of the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, and just that notion of preferential attachment um, is enough to take a network from sort of randomness and turn it into a scale-free network. Um, and it's something that's easily imaginable in the context of scholarship. Um, certain authors are canonical. Certain um, ideas were more frequently exposed to than others. And so those are the things that we end up citing in our own work. And so other people read our work and see those citations and think to use them in their own. Um, so if there's a particular article that's being cited frequently, it sort of picks up steam and it becomes richer um, at a quicker pace. So these two simple changes um, radically transform networks. Hubs begin to appear, and I think if you, this is a little bit darker, you can kind of see where the, the hubs emerge in that network. Um, and if you chart, this is the same kind of chart where it's numbers of links on the horizontal axis and um, numbers of nodes on the on vertical. I think I have that flipped. But what you have is a small number of nodes that have lots of connections, and then a whole bunch of nodes that have very few. Um, and that's the sort of expression of a power law. Um, when Chris Anderson was writing about the long tail, that's a long tail graph. Um, contrast that with the sort of bell curve of a random graph. So these kinds of networks are said to be scale free because there's no consistency among nodes. Um, some have lots of connections, uh, most have very few. And there's also a lack of proportional importance the rich nodes get richer at a, faster play, at a faster pace. So their relationship to the other nodes in the network changes just as the, their importance changes. Um, one example that, uh, that Barabasi uses in linked to talk about the difference between scale and scale-free networks is the difference between road traffic and air traffic or travel. Um, in order to fly down here yesterday, I boarded a plane in Syracuse flew to Detroit, caught my connector by the skin of my teeth, and landed down here. And air travel is like that. What, the network of air travel is a handful of hubs that connect to every other place in the country. You hit a hub, and you can get just about anywhere within the network in just two steps. Now, if I'd driven down here, it would have taken me like three days. And I would have had to go through Buffalo, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Louisville, Memphis, Little Rock, Dallas. Um, it's, I mean, it would have been eight degrees of separation, and there's no way of sort of shortcutting through the system. And that's really one of the differences between a scaled network and a scale-free network. Um, scaled networks are much more orderly and much more stable, um, but you also have to sort of work your way through, through them to get from one point to another. Um, another example for thinking about scale versus scale-free um, that to me is really sort of quick and easy is just to think about your Facebook feed. Um, Facebook encourages you to organize your feed according to top stories as opposed to most recent. Um, most recent stories means that when you log on, you're going to just see whatever's happened in the last 15 minutes. You have an equal chance of seeing anything. It just depends on when you access it. Top stories pushes the, feed, pushes the stories in your feed that have received the most likes and shares to the top, making it more likely that you'll see them and more likely that you yourself will like them and share them and keep them in the top of the feed. Um, so just that, I mean, really, that Facebook toggle is a toggle between scale and scale-free networks in terms of your, um, your feed. Um, so I, I sort of spent a little bit of time sort of laying out this difference between scale and scale-free. But I do want to sort of kind of hedge and say that they're not as, the difference between them is not as stark as I've laid out here today. Um, just as there isn't anything that would have prevented me from flying into Dallas yesterday and then driving down, um, most networks are actually made up of multiple networks. And sometimes one layer to top another. Um, and sometimes there's tension between those layers and sometimes there isn't. Those different layers, though, depend on the dimensions along which you trace them. Um, one of the things that I think we haven't paid as much attention to in the humanities is the tradition of social network analysis that kind of emerges in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it emerges as a way of sort of understanding how different network layers interact within organizations. Um, so, for example, there are obvious differences between something like this, which is an official sort of organizational chart, and then the social dynamics that operate within a given company or department or organization. Um, so on this chart, 
you may have the safety officer and the coordinator of PQ studies on opposite sides of the organizational chart, but they may spend their time together on the weekends having cookouts with their families. And they may chat a little bit about work. Um, so information may f flow through the organization in a different way than the organizational chart implies. Social network analysis, uh, analysts would map out these multiple networks within an organization and they would look for places where the flow of information could be improved, where the arrangements of offices might facilitate particular rela relationships within the organization. Um, and they did this by studying the interactions amongst the different types of networks that were operating in a given locale. Um, before I sort of move on to the third part of my talk, I want to do a little bit of synthesis and kind of connect this notion of network studies with the earlier stuff about tropics. Um, I've been hinting at that relationship, I think, all the way through here, but let me make it a little bit more explicit. Um, I want to pull forward the White's discussion of the modality of the relationships among things, as well as Watts's definition of networks, and I hope that what you see is kind of a resonance there between them. Um, to them, I want to add uh, Bruno Latour's discussion of networks from his inquiry into modes of existence. Um, Latour, when he offers his definition of networks, he gives the example of the network of natural gas pipelines in Russia. And he, he writes that gas pipelines are not made of gas, but rather of steel tubing, pumping stations, international treaties, treatises, Russian mafiosi, pylons anchored in the permafrost, frostbitten technicians, and Ukrainian politicians. Um, this may sound kind of simple, but I'd like to see us push past the notion that networks are somehow the backdrop against which rhetoric takes place. Um, all of these networks are not, they're not just illustrations or metaphors for communication. Networking is what's happening in rhetoric. Like when rhetoric takes place, networks are also taking place. Um, so I, I, mean, I, I want to argue that networks are deeply rhetorical in ways that were, I think we, that we've been slow to come to terms with. And then I also believe the reverse that rhetoric is fundamentally networked. Um, for me, this means that um, the modalities represented by the master tropes give us a way of distinguishing amongst the different behaviors of networks. And the networks themselves illustrate those modalities in ways that we haven't had access to before, um, particularly in the case of scale-free networks. To put it another way, the tropics of discourse, the tropics of discourse, help us to see networks as something other than an undifferentiated mass of nodes and links. And I think networks can help us to complicate our understanding of the relationship amongst the tropes. I think that networks, because they're multi-layered and because they're often overlapping, offer us a way of moving away from kind of the tropes in this sort of lockstep sequence. Um, I don't know that what I want to say is quite as simple as this little map. Um, this is kind of a synthesis of what, I was, what I've been talking about today. Um, I haven't quite convinced myself yet that it's this simple, but I'm getting closer to that point. Um, the more I look into it, the more I see these kind of resonances between tropics of discourse and network studies. Um, so what I want to do is close with a little bit of speculation um, and actually kind of return to the idea of entropy and sort of the reference in my title. First, though, I want to give you one more example of a contrast between scaled and scale-free networks. Um, and this is pulled from the work that Derek Mueller and I did for the Three C's online archive. Um, what I have for you here are two different lists. Um, on, the li on the left is a list of about 10 years worth of the Braddock Award winners from the journal College Composition and Communication. And that's the award that's given each year to the, what's considered the best essay in that journal. The list on the right is representative of a little bit longer time scale. But what it is, is a list of the articles from 3Cs that were cited most frequently in 3Cs. That is the articles, the 3Cs articles that received the, the highest number of citations. Um, and let me flip this so you can see where the lists overlap. There's a little bit of overlap there, um, but not tons. The list on the left is synecdochic, it's scalar, in the sense that each of the articles that appears on that list goes through a similar process 
as all of the other ones. Um, each article that gets published in the, in the journal has an equal chance of winning that year's Braddock Award. Um, and in that sense, there's, some, there's representativity involved with that list. Um, the list on the right is much more um, metonymic. It's an aggregation of the choices that a whole bunch of scholars in the field have made. Um, those choices are very individual, they're very localized, they're not necessarily representative in any way. Um, imagine what would happen if we set these two lists in motion, historically. Um, the list on the left would add one essay per year. Each year the, an essay would win the Braddock Award. It would get added to that list. Um, the list would just get longer. But it would basically be the same list of the same kinds of essays. The list on the right, if we sort of set it in a historical motion, um, would change radically. Because particularly if we sort of added the condition that we're only going to track, say, a 10-year window of citations. Um, certain, certain essays would climb the chart. Certain essays would sort of fade off as people stopped engaging with them. Um, what you'd end up with are two very different representations of the field. Um, I think it's kind of a trick question to ask which one is the best. They're both sort of representations that we have access to. Um, both of them provide kind of a history of the field um, in a way that can, I think can be valuable. Um, so what does all of this have to do with entropy? Um, we tend to think of entropy as negative, as decay. Um, I want to argue that, in fact, it's more a, a measure of the potential of a system for change. So one of the ways that systems change is they fall apart, but one of the ways they change is they sort of emerge or they strengthen. Um, those are all, di there are multiple different forms of change. Um, one, Im one important difference between these two lists is that the one on the left changes very little. Um, it stays the same from year to year. It just adds, picks up another essay. The one on the right changes almost issue to issue as certain things get cited, other things don't get cited. Um, it, it's a much more sort of entropic account of the field. Um, in a network with scale, the individual nodes both produce and reflect the, net, the overall system. They generate order through representation, proportion, stability, Individual nodes are like the bricks in a wall. Um, the wall can't exist without them, but their function and their identity is tied closely to the system. Um, scaled networks are very, ch they're very slow to change as a consequence. Um, and honestly, anybody who's ever worked at a university can talk about how slow it is for a scaled network to change, um, you know, or worked in a discipline. Um, it's like you know, steering a, an aircraft carrier. Um, you know, the, the more highly ordered a system is, the more resistant to sort of radical change that system becomes. Um, what I want to suggest today is that the presence or lack of entropy is tied to these models of network topology that scale as sort of a, an expression of synecdoche is one of the ways that networks resist change. It's one of the ways that they build order and make themselves sort of more stable. Um, and then we might say the opposite then of scale-free networks. Um, if scaled networks are characterized by order and stability, scale-free networks are where we've gotten the idea of virality. Um, when an idea goes viral, hashtag white and gold, it spreads quickly and widely, but it rarely has any lasting effect. Um, virality has always been around. I mean, you know, hula hoops, pet rocks, mood rings, the Macarena. Um, yeah. Um, but the scale free networks of social media have sort of amplified this effect. Um, and, we, and it's also helped us develop tools for actually tracking and articulating um, virality, um, tracking these sort of high entropy viral phenomena. Um, virality is not a matter of simply picking the right network and just like setting something loose, despite what so-called viral gurus would have us think. Um, part of the charm of virality is its unpredictability, its ability to kind of come out of nowhere and surprise us with its, its impact, um, and to sort of momentarily capture our attention. Um, one important implication of virality is, is that it's not entirely within our grasp, um, much to the dismay of marketing professionals around the world. But it's not wholly non-human either. Um, this is a very stark 
slide, but it's, um, it's a reproduction of the Google search results for Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, and that's my final example for today is the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge that happened last summer. Um, you can see how uh, nobody was searching for Ice Bucket Challenge in 2005. But um, really, this sort, of, this sort of profile is the perfect sort of a kind of visual expression of a viral message. It's something that like spikes in attention over a really short period of time and then just vanishes. Um, but entropy also gives us a tool for thinking about the relationship of the Ice Bucket Challenge to ALS research. On the one hand, by attaching the challenge to charity, I think the ALS Foundation um, provided, provided people with an altruistic motive for sharing it, made them feel good for sharing it on Facebook and for liking it. Um, and in that sense, it increased the sort of entropy of the, the challenge, making it more likely to spread and it spread more widely. Um, at the same time, by tying the challenge to, to donations, you could argue that the foundation actually reduced its em entropy. Um, and in a sense, it actually was able to attach kind of a lasting effect to the Ice Bucket Challenge. Within, I think, the month of July, the foundation made, I think, about $30 million on the Ice Bucket Challenge, which was compared to, I think, $2 million during the same time period the year before. Um, so entropy gives us a way, I think, of um, sort of understanding how a particular network effect is, I don't want to say necessarily slowed or sped up, but certainly sort of thinking about its capacity for change. I mean, something like the, the Ice Bucket Challenge is certainly more complicated than this. Um, it matters that the challenge took place in the summer. Um, it matters that, for instance, Facebook users are allowed to post videos, that they're allowed to tag other users in status updates, which was not always a feature of Facebook. Um, it matters that certain celebrities in certain sort of spheres of activity took the ice bucket challenge at particular times. Um, all of these things you know, sort of increased or decreased the entropy of this particular event. Um, I think I'm actually just about out of time. Um, so I, what I want to, I just want to just simply close with the point that I think that this mix of network behavior and tropic modalities can open up concepts like entropy for us. Um, to think about the way that discourse circulates through 21st century networks. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this stuff in more detail in Q&A. And honestly, I would prefer it, so. Thank you, Colin. We've got time for questions. I wanna, I've been um, instructed to tell you that you really need to use the microphone. So, um, who would like it? I'll take it. <laughs> so, Colin, loved your talk. <laughs> but what about irony? That's Thank a, you for that question. That's a really good question. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that question. Um, So my first answer is that I need to think about it more. But my second answer, the one that actually is a real answer, is that um, irony is such a weird case because one of the things, one of the places where the idea of the master tropes does get challenged pretty frequently is by people who are asking whether or not irony is actually the fourth one. Um, now my sort of thumbnail definition of irony is that it's an instance where the actual meaning of something exceeds its literal meaning. And to me, that definition resonates with an idea like Timothy Morton's hyperobjects. Um, the idea of a network that exceeds our capacity to actually comprehend it as a network. Um, so I wonder if like hyperobject isn't another term for what I might think of as an ironic network. But I'm not sure that that quite works. That's really a like a stab in the dark kind of answer. But great question. Yeah, Diane. So since I have the mic, so now you open up the question of allegory. Yeah. So if we want to go to Demond's um, allegory and irony, which are paratropes. Yeah. 
what what would be the difference then in terms of networks and network theory between I have no good answer for okay. that question. And here's, and here's why, because for about the last year, I've been really thinking just in terms of scale versus scale free. And for me, that's metonymy versus synecdoche. This move of thinking about these ordered networks as kind of allegories is a really new addition to this. And it's one that I haven't like, managed to work my way all the way through yet. Um, and so I think it works, but it, might, it also might not work. I was asking because your definition of irony mm -hmm. is also an alleg a definition of allegory. If you're uh -huh. going to leave it that broad, yeah. right? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so I do. then, where, how would you make a distinction in terms yeah. of network order or non-order? But okay, it's it's getting mean to push it now because you're yeah. okay. So no, it's a fair question. It just you know I just don't have an answer for it. So well, yeah, and I want to <laughs> pursue it. My question is pretty simple, and it's just, do you, how do you see a formal definition of entropy working for your project? I see you sort of talking around it. Mm -hmm. I totally feel like I have a conceptual understanding of it, but I'm missing that sort of theoretical definition. And the reason that I ask, or sort of the connection that I see, is that your project both begins and ends with things that we might not see as particularly friendly to rhetoric. One, Ramus, who attempts to reduce rhetoric to a series of categorizations um, and leaves a sort of anti-rhetorical legacy in the Enlightenment that lasts for quite a long time. Yeah. And two, the idea of entropy as a scientific concept is to measure disorder, yeah. something that we as rhetoricians may see as another attempt to categorize and therefore discount. Yeah. Um, so could you give us a sort of more definitive definition of entropy and speak to those two framing concerns? Yeah, I, I probably can't give you a more definitive um, definition of entropy. Well, that's okay if you don't want to measure the disorder. That, well, but I think we treat, like entropy is sort of understood in this kind of negative way. And the opposite of, of entropy is sort of order. But order is not always good. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of inequalities and inequities that are embedded within particular social orders. And so I don't think, I don't, to me it doesn't I have a positive or negative valence necessarily. I think there can be positive and negative instances of order, positive and negative instances of entropy. So for me, entropy is more about sort of a system's propensity for change. And I don't necessarily feel like, um, well, it's, I don't think that disorder is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think, for example, I mean, one of the layers that sort of adds on to this discussion of citation is I was thinking about um, Sarah Ament's, like some of her blog posts about um, like citationality as world building and the way that particular scholars are adopting certain strategies to kind of introduce some disorder into what's traditionally been a very white male hetero sort of, you know, network of publications. And so, um, I mean, is that kind of an answer? I just want to clarify that I wasn't saying that disorder is a negative yeah. or no, a positional didn't. characteristic, yeah. or sorry, criteria of rhetoric, but rather that uh, to measure the disorder may relate in some way to Ramos' yeah. reductionist view of, of rhetoric itself. But still, uh, yeah. thank you. That was a good answer. Okay, thanks. Um, so one of the questions that I have is sort of how these networks um, exist within these tropes in terms of sort of a static moment as opposed to sort of a, a, a time, a timeline of their mm -hmm. citationality. So you give the example of sort of the scale-free number of citations um, showing up in C's and sort of how, that, how that's going to change. Um, but it was interesting, like when you were, when you had that list of what those sources were, a lot of them were uh, sort of manifestos, like it was things like uh, Harrison's diversity and ideology, uh, Gears uh, kitchen tables, uh, the extracurriculum one, Royster's when the first voice you hear is not your own. Like a lot of these, um, if you look at them, they, they start to fall into hierarchies, yeah. and they kind of form more into that sort of really structured sense that he, these are the manifesto documents of these different moves. And so if you're going to be you know, doing something about, um, for example, composition as a woman, you're gonna be citing composing as a woman. Or right. um, 
the rhetoric as agent of social change is also going yeah. to be in a certain hierarchical point to a lot of others. And so it seems like if you're capturing a moment in time of those citations, it's definitely going to be sort of that scale-free structure. Right. But if you're thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, when those citations are being made, uh, they'll continually be going back to the same sort of manifesto articles uh, that are sort of analogous across the different communities. Yeah. Does that make sense? I feel like yeah, it does. I, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about that, the, the list on the right side, is there are like, there are some sort of patterns, some sort of strategic patterns that you can see. Um, so that like, I mean, there was a real interest in community at a time when people were looking for an, an essay like Harris's that actually sort of deals with the definition of what a community actually is. Um, I mean, Hairston is an example from kind of the opposite end of things, because in fact, most of the citations of Hairston are people who are violently disagreeing with her essay. Um, you know, so you, there, are, there are different ways to get on the list, and it makes it interesting for me to think about like sort of what the, I don't know, like what the strategies are and what kinds of potential sort of entropy those different sort of strategies might have. I mean, I, it, to me, there, there's like a, in a, a connection that I still need to sort of work through in terms of like genre studies and the way that particular moves might contribute or detract from the scale of a, uh, like a citation map or something like that. Harrison or Cushman, they're sort of identifying themselves into a community. Oh, yeah. It's a sort of yeah, like yeah. a high, and, and that hierarchy could be oppositional um, as yeah. well as sort of supportive. Yeah. But yeah, I like it. Makes sense. Good work. Thank you. I kind of just want to take it back to what Laura asked and maybe add a little bit. Sure. Um, working off of that, do you see the project of thinking about rhetoric and entropy as doing more than? quantifying mm -hmm. entropy uh, or like because mm -hmm. I hear you say things like adds to the entropy or mm -hmm. you know moves it towards like on a scale yeah. from scale to scale less yeah. so I'm wondering what happens in that project other than quantifying like you and me both um, I honestly I mean I don't think of myself as like a huge quantifier um, and I don't think that I mean my end goal isn't to sort of like you know throw lots and lots of distribution graphs at, at people to say, aha, look, this article is, this article has 0.73 entropy. Um, <laughs> I, th but I think that, I think there are ways of talking about the, the sort of capacity for change or the potential of a system for change sort of within this context that doesn't necessarily, I mean, it, to me, some of these visualizations are just really kind of snapshotty ways of pointing it out, like, so I don't wanna, um, I don't think we have the resources that will let us do sort of the equivalent kind of Google searches of like articles, for example. Although there's, a, I mean, a little bit of that with citation stuff. Um, but I do think that those, vis the sort of quantifications and the visualizations um, have sort of helped me to, to understand them a little bit more viscerally. So I don't, to me, that's not the end point. Um, and in some ways, I'm not sure how you would even do that. So, um, you know, I, I mean, that sounds really half-hearted of me. That an that whole answer just sounded really half-hearted. Um, where, where do you want the endpoint to be? Yeah. Where do you want this to move towards? Um, this is gonna. I mean, I, entropy is a is a recent sort of addition onto this. And part of what I'm trying to think about is. I see, well, like for example, last fall, um, uh, there was an interview in Salon with George Lakoff about the 10 year anniversary of Don't Think Like an Elephant and his whole discussion of how liberals need to frame their arguments in terms of their global message better, which is a, really a very sort of synecdochic model for how political discourse operates. And I see that kind of model really bumping heads with, um, what's a much more metonymic sort of model of political discourse that's operating today? I mean, the Tea Party isn't, we have this big vision of how things should work, and let me sort of express it in, at the local level. It's, you know, we're against you. Um, uh, you, but against liberals, or against the president, or against whomever. Um, 
in a way that answering that with like more synecdoche doesn't feel like a very good answer. And so part of me just sees this kind of clash of mindset operating in all these different milieu and wants to try and develop some vocabulary for getting at what's going on. Because it, I mean, there are days where I feel like the barbarians are at the gate, where I feel like we're at a really horrible time in terms of like political discourse and social discourse and that we're like, I don't know, reaching some kind of aporia. Um, on my more optimistic days, I want it to be able to sort of understand what's happening and sort of figure out ways that we might address it. Thank you. Yeah. If entropy has a sort of creative potential, and the Tea Party example I think is a really good one, I think they would be like the agents of entropy, right? Like their whole point, or at least a lot of the position is to you know, take a system that they don't like anyways and to kind of, you know. Destabilize. Yeah, yeah, let it go, yeah. right? What kind of potentials do, might you see in that position then? If, if entropy is something right. that you, you want to look at positively. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's like the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from my personal perspective, it's the dark side of destabilization. But I, but I think that, you know, I, I mean, I used this example before. I think that there are um, very well-established very stable, very long-held kinds of order that are not necessarily good. You know, I mean, the, the resistance to change is not something that's wholly positive or negative. And there are places where if this kind of stuff can kind of, you know, kind of um, re-describe or reformulate or give us an opportunity to, like, destabilize, you know, in positive ways, I think that that's just as that's just as much sort of a potential of this work, hopefully. Josh has been raising his hand for like five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, I, I loved your talk. Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm going to be the guy that says, why aren't you doing what I research? Yeah. Um, this, it's actually just, a, just to say uh, I really enjoyed the analysis here. Thanks. When I hear entropics, though, I, you know, it gets it gets me thinking about psychoanalysis or affect, right? Because one of the things that that you're mapping here um, are routes of affect, mm -hmm. right? Or, or different routes yeah. which rhetoric lubricates, right? Uh, these different ways of feeling. Um, it's hard for me to get outside of my little Freudian bubble, but entropics sounds like to me the drives, right? And I mean, what all drives ultimately, right? Freud concluded are death drives. They, in, they, they aim toward entropy. Yeah. And so what rhetoric comes in to, to do is to stop, mm. stop, the, stop the entropy. And so these spikes in unscaled networks are really right, a kind of enjoyment, jouissance, mm. chance, mm -hmm. uh, breaking up the automaton. Uh, so it's a really nice way to sort of explain you know, uh, what people are thinking in another discourse about rhetoric, too. Cool. So I, yeah, I, just offer that up that there's a way to recoup awesome. entropics yeah. by sort of hitching it to, to affect in some cool. way. Thank you. Uh, can I make it about my scholarship too? <laughs> you started it. So I was thinking <laughs> in a very different vein um, about Derrida's work with autoimmune hmm. systems mm -hmm. and that um, that no system, no democracy, no nothing can work that doesn't automatically eat itself and turn itself inside out. And that way it gets to begin again, mm -hmm. right, as well. But it's part of any structural network, right, whether it's your body mm -hmm. or, right, but, um, and, or a democracy, right, where, where um, in some democracy you stall a vote because you know some anti-democratic force is going to, right, so it's built in, and then what have you got? What have you become? And yet it also is what lets you live. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I can say anything to that, except just to not kind of nod and say yes. All right. Thank you for your talk, first of all. Um, could you... 
clearly define the stakes of your project in terms of the disagreement about the valence of posthumanism in the academy? Um, hmm. Probably not. Um, the the sort of like kind of the the 140 character idea that I had in my head, one of the ones I had in my head as I was starting this was the notion that humanist rhetoric, that one of the effects of humanist rhetoric is the production of scale. Um, and I've done other talks where I've kind of mapped this sort of relationship out more explicitly than I did today. Um, because I'm just I'm trying to push it in different directions as well. Um, But in terms of, I mean, I, for me, if, if you buy that notion, if you sort of are willing to agree with Tumber, even if you don't sort of buy into her um, uh, feelings about it, that it's a particularly humanist disposition to think in terms of parts and wholes. And I can see that sort of operating in a lot of, a lot of people who are trying to defend particular humanist methodologies against the digital humanities are engaged in the defense of synecdoche as sort of a modality. Um, so if you associate sort of synecdoche and humanism, as Foucault kind of does, and as I think some of the people who are arguing against the digital humanities do, um, one of the things for me that kind of, that network studies um, helps me to think about is the idea that it doesn't have to be like, um, you know, that we all turn into robots or zombies or werewolves if we're thinking about post-humanist rhetorics. That these rhetorics are, um, or non-humanist rhetorics. I mean, honestly, my inclination is to be a little bit more Latourian and to say that it's not so much that post-humanist rhetorics are what come after so much as they're the things that we've been ignoring to sort of pay attention to humanist rhetorics. Um, I think that there are rhetorics that circulate that don't get captured by, by Burke's very humanist project, for example. Um, and so I'm not super happy with post-humanist. I might be more interested in like non-humanist or a humanist or. Anna. Yeah, and a humanist. Um, but so for me, network studies, I mean, it's the thing that, it's the sort of corrective that network studies applies for me to the tropics, which is that to think of them as layers rather than as a sequence where one has to begin and, you know, and another has to end in order for that to begin. Um, I mean, I think that that sort of notion of the sequence is what part of what fuels the anxiety once you hit, sort of start reaching the end of a particular cycle. And it doesn't need to be that way. I, I, the, the sort of, I, 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 there is a degree to which I think it's kind of faux panic, but the sort of panic over the digital humanities are gonna destroy us all is, kind of comical to me um, because I've always sort of thought of it as you know another sort of set of methods atop which I mean that I can kind of layer on my already the things I already think about as a someone who works in the humanities I, I've never understood the sort of like the idea that it's bringing the bulldozer <laughs> bulldozing our libraries and our museums and stuff it just seems silly to me um, I feel like I've wandered completely off the point of your question. And for that, I apologize. Can we have one more? Anyone have another one? We may have time for one more. Even wax on psychoanalysis. <coughs> your mother. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay, thank you so much, Colin.